I've learned so much from working with Kirsten, working with Tash, working with Ben. I'm just excited. I'm really excited to see how much fun we can have with the NRD community and how we can actually hopefully transform gaming through looking at how people play and how we can reduce those barriers to play. Hello everyone and welcome to Connecting ALS. I am your host, Jeremy Holden. According to a research article published in a 2020 issue of the journal Simulation and Gaming, more than 65% of adults in America play video games, averaging roughly five hours per week. Which means it's not just those pesky kids who won't manage their screen time who were driving the more than $56 billion spent on video games last year. And that's not surprising. The first in-home video game console was introduced more than 50 years ago. That means that many of today's adults were once those pesky kids who couldn't manage their screen time. And what is true of adults generally, and this should go without saying, is also true for people living with ALS. Research shows that people with ALS around the world play video games to connect with friends and family as an interesting way to raise funds for ALS organizations in their countries and simply for the fun of playing video games. But with declining motor functions, people living with ALS often lose the ability to play video games. And that's a problem. After all, one of the components of making ALS livable is enhancing the quality of life for people living with the disease. That includes optimizing opportunities for people with ALS to have fun, to pursue the things that bring them joy. According to researchers looking into this issue, quote, simply having an opportunity to enjoy the fun and pleasure of hobbies like playing video games has also been found to be important for reducing the worry of what lies ahead when living with a terminal illness and for creating memories and spending quality time with family and loved ones, end quote. Now that comes from a research article that was published in 2021 by researchers out of Australia who want to get a lay of the landscape on video game accessibility for people living with MND, as it is known in Australia. One of the researchers on that team was Dr. Kirsten Harley, honorary lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney and a board member of MND New South Wales. Ten years ago, Kirsten was diagnosed with MND. As Kirsten's disease progressed, one of the things it took away from her was her ability to play games on her tablet and her laptop. So she started to look for ways to tap into assistive technology to allow her to continue gaming. Dr. Harley and her research colleagues are now on a quest to figure out ways to make life more enjoyable for people living with ALS MND who derive joy out of gaming. To learn more about their work, which they presented in December at the Allied Professionals Forum in San Diego, I recently sat down with members of the team, Dr. Harley, along with Dr. Matthew Harrison, Senior Lecturer in Learning Intervention at Melbourne Graduate School of Education, and Dr. Natasha Dwyer, Senior Lecturer in the College of Arts and Education at Victoria University in Melbourne. A fourth member of their research team, Dr. Ben O'Mara, an adjunct fellow at the Center for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales and Information Resources Manager at Motor Neuron Disease Australia, was unable to join the conversation due to a family emergency. Let's hear now about their research. First of all, I want to thank all of you for being with us this week on Connecting ALS. Thank you for having us. Very excited to be here. Yeah, so... It's a great topic to talk about, and I, I had the, the great pleasure of watching a presentation at the International Alliance of ALS m and Associations and the Alliance of Allied Professionals out in San Diego. So really excited to bring this conversation to listeners. Kirsten, I want to start with you. Uh, can you tell listeners a little bit about yourself and your connection to ALS? Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for inviting us to share our research with you and your listeners. I'm Kirsten Harley, an honorary lecturer at the Center for Disability Research and Policy at the University of Sydney and a board member of MFD New South Wales. As listeners may have guessed from my voice, I am a person living with ALS, which in Australia we tend to call motor neuron disease or MND. I was an active 23 year old academic and mom to six year old to me when my husband Denzel and I were given the devastating news that I have MND. 
a clinic nurse accurately described it as a shit sandwich of a disease. MND has progressively taken more and more from me and my family. Now I cannot move, apart from my face, a ventilator breathes for me, I am fed through a tube, and I speak using the synthetic voice of Ryan. I need carers to do almost everything for me. But I can think, write, smile, play and love. I am thankful for the love and support of my beautiful family and friends, and excellent care. And I am grateful beyond words that this month we've celebrated the 10th anniversary since my diagnosis, 10 years with my precious comedian Denzel, 10 years as a sister, daughter, and a young friend. Over the moon to be with you here 10 years in, and uh, you touch on something I think that I think is really important, and, that, and it's that ability to smile, love, laugh. I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's, it's very meaningful. Your Twitter profile, you describe yourself as an honorary lecturer, a parent and partner, a sociologist, an aquaphile, an ex-runner, a maths nerd, a coffee addict, and a vegan or vegetarian for our American listeners. How did you get involved with a research team that is investigating ways to make video games inclusive for people who are living with ALS, or as you said, MND in, in other parts of the world? So I have always enjoyed playing games, whether sitting around a table playing 500 or board games, or playing puzzle or word games on my screen. As my motor neuron disease has progressed and taken from me so many of the activities I previously enjoyed, I have really appreciated the way that assistive technology has enabled me to have fun and special moments connecting with family playing games on my phone. On my blog, I have written about the fantastic neuro node I use to control my phone, including playing games by lifting my superhero eyebrows. Our excellent team leader, Ben O'Mara, read my blog and invited me to join the research project on making video games more inclusive for people living with MMD or ALS. It's been terrific meeting as a team that includes different research backgrounds and perspectives, but is united by the goal of making gaming inclusive and fun. And, you know, Ben, unfortunately unable to be with us tonight, we're wishing him and his family his best. But I, I want to bring the rest of the team is, uh, Matt, I'll start with you. What do we know at this point about the opportunities to make video games more inclusive? What are some of the challenges and what are some of the opportunities that exist today? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. It's just working with Kirsten and Ben and, and Tash has been such a wonderful experience. So we really wanted to explore how we can position gaming or reposition gaming as a way to keep people connected as they as they go through a similar experience to a, as Kirsten has told us about, which is obviously very difficult. So we conducted a scoping review where we looked at research from around the world. We wanted to find out what do we actually know about making gaming inclusive for people who are experiencing these changes in their physical capabilities and what can we do to be able to harness this to keep people connected? So we looked at literature from around the world. We tried to keep it in the last 10 years. And we want to really try to find the voices of people who actually who have, have undergone or have MN, living with MMD or ALS. And to be able to see what they think works best for them. Because that's so important. And what we found was uh, disappointingly, but not surprising was that there's actually very little of that voice in the academic literature. So we looked at what's called the grey literature, blogs like Kirsten's, people actually living who are documenting, and that has been an absolute goldmine for finding out what people are doing, how they're hacking existing gaming systems to be able to, to make it accessible for more people. And that's really where we've found, I, I think we've found the, the really good stuff. I'd say the, the meat on the bone, so to speak, or the tofu in Kirsten's case as a vegetarian. <laughs> I love it. Tasha, we, you know, when we first started talking about, you know, this conversation, and, you know, this is something that Matt and I talked about when, when we had the opportunity to chat out in San Diego. 
but you know, I was thinking about the potential therapeutic benefit of this, but the, the but this can really transcend that. And, and and setting aside the potential for a therapeutic benefit, what is the value of looking at things like optimizing the ability for for people with motor neuron challenges to play video games, to to make video games more inclusive, just for the sake of fun? So what we've found is the importance of connection and being able to have a space where it's okay to be able to forget about the world for a while. That's come out in, in the great literature. And as Matt was talking about the, the Toshu sheath, there's such a wealth of expertise from lived experience and people sharing tips on what they've found. And any anyone with an interest in the inclusivity would need to be able to keep a, their, this material on their radar to be able to see how new technologies are being adopted and where the strengths are, where's the weaknesses and how do we mitigate where there might be a problem with the tech to be able to work out how to fix it. And as well as individuals networking, local initiatives are up to amazing things as well, like the Makers Making Change initiative, which have a library of open source devices that can be made and customised and are leading the way with 3D printed joysticks and of course, uh, using that to leverage change within mainstream hardware and software game players, as in industry developers. I want to get to the potential of industry developers and, and their their willingness or potential willingness to to be partners on this. But you mentioned an important word there, and I think that's the connectivity. And you know, when I think back to you know when I was a kid, I want to. Uh, well, I, I date myself on the show too frequently, and I always say I don't want to do that. But when I think back to when I was a kid, like you know, playing Donkey Kong or Qbert or you know the the advanced game of Super Mario Brothers, you're in good company here, Jeremy. I have to say, <laughs> Kirsten, Tash, myself, and Ben can very much relate. Yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> For sure. But the connectivity was like, potentially you could have your neighbors over to grab the second controller, but games are far more connective today than they used to be. So talk a little bit, and this is for, for anybody, talk a little bit about the connective potential of making games inclusive. I'll send that one to Matt and Kirsten, if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. Um, I was thinking Kirsten provides this wonderful example, Jeremy, of the idea of code building in Minecraft when the interface with the hardware wasn't working the way expected, so she couldn't play, but she could watch her daughter and her husband playing Minecraft and, and give feedback through the communication system she had. But then the neuronode device that she's describing now, she could, she was using to play turn-based games like Monument, and we share a love of that particular game. The idea of turn-based games and the able to interact directly with people and connect with people, even through online spaces, through these alternative interfaces, is really the idea of hardware affording connection. The idea that is reducing those barriers to allow people to connect through ways that maybe they connected before their diagnosis or even new ways, finding different ways, alternative ways to connect through this hardware. So we do make social connection. I think it's really what we as humans all want. And I, I work predominantly with the autistic community and there's that stereotype that people don't want to connect. Of course they do. I think that's what makes us human is that need for connection. And I think something like a, a diagnosis of AMD, like Kirsten's story is so powerful because it shows how important that keeping that connection is in, in defining who we are as people. Talked a little bit about developers. Uh, what have you seen, whether it's in the gray literature or, or as you explore this bit, this um, opportunity to make video games more inclusive, you know, a potential for game developers to be willing partners to develop games that are more inclusive. Ash, I think this one's for you. Sure. So uh, the literature I've been reading is more about uh, individuals and organizations uh, mulling over the nuances of how to get these games going rather than the willingness of industry to be able to work with this. And I know there's disappointments as well that are recorded in these blogs of companies saying, woohoo, we've done all this woohoo work and actually it's lip service. But there is genuine attempts as, as well. But the material I've been reading in the grade literature is, for instance, working out how to deal with stiff controls 
and also about the issue of changing attitudes about the level of difficulty in gaming and that it shouldn't be an issue, which of course is a win for everybody. The mobile game hardware developers are the one, the hardware space there, they're the ones that cop the biggest flack for not adapting, is my understanding from the great literature. And I'm sure Matt and Kirsten have more to add on that one. It's really interesting, I think, Tash, because in this case, we see groups like Able Gamers who are going around and they're hacking controllers to make them more accessible or finding ways to bridge interfaces like Kirsten's NeuroNode device that she was speaking about earlier with existing games and to make them compatible and to make it work. Uh, And that has sort of, I don't want to use the word shamed, but it's really given the major companies, it's shown them that there's a need there and it's kind of shown them the light and the way. And and Sony of of PlayStation fame has just announced they've got a new accessible controller and it seems to be built very similar way to the Microsoft Adaptive Controllers released a few years ago. Mm. So I'm optimistic the companies are starting to take accessibility and inclusion more seriously. But this drive has really come from the community. I think that's something that's not acknowledged in the academic research, that a lot of this hasn't been driven by big labs, but it's been driven by people like Kirsten, Kirsten's family, people like that, who have this lived experience and see this need and want to keep playing together. And then they've had to to go online and read blogs and go onto YouTube videos and modify existing hardware. And there's been enough groundswell, enough talk about that, through that grey literature that the gaming companies are starting to have to take this seriously because if they don't, people are sort of calling them out on it, saying this game is inaccessible to a large section of our community. Yeah, it's important to kind of public pressure component of things. Um, you know, I, I've been around enough research to know that the, the conclusion is often more research is needed, but where are we now and, and, and where does this fight, where does this campaign go from here? What, what, what's the future look like in terms of making gaming more accessible? Before we hop to that, I would just like to remind Matt of the concept that you're really interested in, of the the rating for accessibility, to have a, mm. a sticker on a game. Yes. Thank you, Tash. We did have this idea that games should be like the way that we rate for content, whether it's appropriate for children or for adults. Having an accessibility rating that's mandatory on the game box and makes it really visible and really easy for people to see whether this game is an inclusive game or whether this game creates barriers to users who use alternative interfaces like Kirsten. So we would love to see that mandated across around the world, like the Peggy system is around the world. That's the age-based rating system for video games. That's used, there's different versions of that used in different countries, but we would love to see in the Australian context, the US context, right around the world, some sort of rating on accessibility features. And that would hopefully drive the industry to investing more in this space. Like I said previously, I think there already is happening in terms of there already is investment now. And that's come from that public groundswell. This, would, I think, would really speed things up and get people thinking about accessibility as not an optional extra. It's an integral part of the experience. So in terms of where we're going, Cash, I was thinking about BCIs. And I was thinking about, I know you've done a lot of reading in this space. Do you want to talk a bit about BCIs? Explain what they are. I was sure. But um, I'd just like to hop in with a, um, answering Jeremy's question about future steps and coming from a completely different angle working out how to deal with the learning curve of adapting, of using this technology so that it's not a formidable task for somebody to just hop on board. So people who are new to gaming can be able to get that connection would be one way in, which is to do with, of course, design, but it's also to do with, I guess, training as well. So the BCI space, that's the brain-computer interface, of course, and that's about looking at ways that can be used as a game controller. I probably haven't done a very good explanation of that, but as we've discussed, that some of the studies that we've found, the games that they're using with people are pretty, well, you know, it's boring. <laughs> a boring game, like tic-tac-toe. Some people might like that, but that if that interactivity of the game was stripped away, that anything could be put on top of that 
So we're hoping that there'll be more research in the future that's not just looking at the technical component, but also the design component. I want to circle back to this idea of of having fun for the sake and for the intrinsic value of having fun. And you know, you you talk about some of the BCI technology, which, from my perspective, seems pretty cutting edge, but an exciting space. Do you sense that using cutting edge technology for the sake of simply having fun gets brushed aside for things that we maybe put greater value on it. We put higher on the Maslow hierarchy of need. And like, are those lost opportunities to say, here's cutting edge technology and let's just tap into this to allow people to have fun simply for the sake of having fun. Well, I can see Kirsten's using her superpower eyebrows (laughs) to say absolutely yes. Yeah. (laughs) And I agree personally. I, I think Tash, the idea that fun and joy as an outcome in itself is often overlooked, whether it's health or education or whatever space you're in, the idea that life is precious and you know, having these, these moments of joy that you share with people in and of themselves is so important. And we see that in the blogs, we see that in the vlogs and the gray literature. Unfortunately, the academic side, um, I have to say, we must be a pretty boring bunch because a lot of the studies we reviewed 1,715 studies, particularly in the health space, but also the education space. And very few really cared about whether the people actually enjoyed using these these technologies. And as Tash was saying, people are playing these games, which will really seem to be functional tests of whether the technology worked or not. He wasn't really asking, do people actually want to do this with their time? Yeah. And you mentioned Super Mario Brothers. I would much rather be playing Super Mario Brothers or Monument or Minecraft than playing Tic-Tac-Toe. Don't get me wrong. Tic-Tac-Toe can be fun. For all the listeners out there here are big Tic-Tac-Toe fans. See, Kirsten's agreeing. But (laughs) (laughs) But I think personally, I, I think we should really be thinking about, okay, not just can we do something, but do our participants actually want to be doing this? Yeah, yeah. The way end users actually want to be doing this. This is how they want to spend their time. Well, you mentioned Tic Tac Toe, and Kirsten earlier mentioned 500, and I'm I'm ready for a game of 500. Uh, let's just let's get that set up quickly. Tasha and Matt, did, did you guys have any closing thoughts before uh, I let you all get back to the the important work that you're doing? I just think it's such an important space. We're so lucky. We've got Ben O'Mara, who couldn't be here today. He's from uh, Motor Neuron Disease Australia, and he works with the uh, Social Impact Centre at at the University of New South Wales. And I'm just so grateful for him to bring us together, to bring Kirsten in with her professional research lived exp- and her lived experience, Tash with her work at VU around interface design, uh, to bring us all together, I think, is such a, an important part of this project. And I've learned so much from working with Kirsten, working with Tash, working with Ben. I'm just excited. I'm really excited to see how much fun we can have with the NRD community and how we can actually hopefully transform gaming through looking at how people play and how we can reduce those barriers to play. Yeah, and really transform the lived experience of people who are, you know, are currently maybe cut out of the gaming community. Team, so this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time, really appreciate the work that you're doing and, and looking forward to what comes next. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> I want to thank my guests this week, Dr. Kirsten Harley, Dr. Matthew Harrison, and Dr. Natasha Dwyer. I also want to thank their colleague, Dr. Ben O'Mara, for his contribution to this work. We're sending the best to him and his family. If you like this episode, share it with a friend. And while you're at it, rate and review Connecting ALS wherever you listen to podcasts. It is a great way for us to connect with more listeners. Our production partner for this series is Citizen Racecar. Post-production by Alex Brower. Production management by Gabriella Montekin supervised by David Hoffman. That's going to do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll connect with you again soon.